Uh, thank you for having me. I uh, took a couple hour tour of downtown today, a walking tour, and I gotta say, it's really changed since I came here last time 10 years ago. It's, uh, some things have changed, some things haven't, but it's really remarkable uh, the progress you've made and how it's really beginning to feel like a different city. There's a different vibe, there's a different energy, and, and that momentum you can sort of feel as you're walking around, and I think that's, uh, that's a hard thing to change, and clearly you, you've done it, and so you should be congratulated for that. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, trends I see both globally, then nationally, and, uh, and then in North Carolina. And I've worked uh, lots of different places. This is a project that I just couldn't believe. It was one of the first projects we started at Kling Stubbins. It's called Moscow on the Hudson. And this is a Russian uh, billionaire that decided he wants to build an entire new city, 13 multi-story, 20, 30-story skyscrapers along the Moscow River. And we designed every one of them. I don't think uh, they're being built now when the oil price dropped, but this was the largest, by far, the largest urban project I've ever been involved in. My job was to think about how to integrate the transit system and get people in and out of this place. Then the next project I worked on was for the Kingdom of Morocco, and this is sort of their version of RTP, uh, the Research Triangle Park. It's a science eco city. Now, most people don't know that Morocco is basically the Saudi Arabia of phosphates. Right, they have a 300 year supply of phosphate, which is really important for fertilizer and cleaning products and things like that. And, and they have more of it than anybody else. So they're now finally trying to move their economy into the 21st century. And my role here was to help them think about the downtown portion of this and how that this new city would interact with its residents and have a vital, vibrant commercial core. This one for sure is gonna be built. It's called Mazagon. And this is the one I'm most proud of because a lot of these other things were importing something from somewhere else, right? Manhattan on the Moscow, the RTP in Morocco. This is the King Abdullah City for Atomic and Renewable Energy. It's uh, just to the east of Riyadh in, in, in um, Saudi Arabia. And my role here was to help them decide how does this city grow over time? So you can see there's these little pods here that grow and, and grow over time. And they're basically small towns of about 10 to 15,000 people centered around the community mosque. You know, you have to pray five times a day so the mosque becomes the center of the community. And, and these were designed to grow slowly over time and eventually become a city of 300,000. This was an international competition that my firm was invited to compete in with 15 other firms. And just to get ideas, right, the king paid all of us. Our fee alone was $1.5 million, and there were 15 other firms. So you can imagine he spent about $30 million just to get an idea for what the city of the future might look like. So this is what's going on all around us. What's happening in North Carolina? I think there's five big game changers coming for us over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. One is the emergence of the Southeast mega region. So like this area between New York or Washington and Boston, this is uh, going to be similar, the area for, sort of from east and Raleigh down to Birmingham, Alabama. We're growing fast, you're growing here in, in Greenville, we're growing fast in Raleigh, Charlotte, everywhere along the I-85 corridor. We're unique, maybe uh, you don't know, but North Carolina is only one of two states in the union that owns its own railroad. So we, uh, the state of North Carolina is the one shareholder for the North Carolina Railroad and we own a 200 foot wide right away basically from Moorhead City to Charlotte. As taxpayers, we own it. And that's a unique position because if you've ever tried to negotiate with CSX or Norfolk Southern for anything, um, you know, their first answer is always no and we have some leverage here. The other state is Alaska. National you know, cyclical economics, right? So a big part, you know, people say, oh, Dan, you had all this great role in downtown Raleigh, you helped turn it around, but really we hit the business cycle at the right time. You know, we had four or five years of good redevelopment before the crash hit in 2008. And you know, it's been about eight years, nine years coming up now since our last calamity, and uh, the cycle is typically six to eight years, so we'll see, but either way, in a down economy, it's a good time to plan to be ready for when we come out, and if you still have momentum going into a good economy, you should leverage it as much as you can because when it slows down, it's gonna slow down for a while and take some time to recover. Whoops, and then the last one is the importance of leadership. 
I don't know how I did it, but I convinced my boss at Jacobs to pay me to visit all 16 cities in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia that were over 150,000 in urban population and hold focus groups to ask them, what are your challenges and opportunities in downtown? And I can tell you the one differentiator when you go from all those cities and see the ones that are succeeding the best and doing, doing well in downtown is leadership. Without it, I mean, if you have a new mayor or a new city manager every two years, each one has a different priority, things change, money gets redirected, resources get reinvested, and, and progress is really hard to make. So when you think about the great cities in these, in these three states, you know, Mayor Riley in Charleston, Mayor Knox in Greenville, Mayor Meeker in Raleigh, Mayor Bell in Durham, these people, Mayor Joins in, in Winston. These folks have been there a long time, and so you've got to have consistent leadership with a strong vision that pushes your community forward. And that's especially true in downtown because not everybody feels an emotional connection to it. You know, there's probably lots of people in this county that haven't been de into downtown Greenville in a long time. When we started the revitalization in Raleigh, I commissioned a survey and we found 65% of the people in the city of Raleigh had come downtown once a year or never. And this was in 2002. So if you conducted that survey again today, it's completely reversed. It's probably only a third of the people haven't been downtown yet. So, you know, leadership is important. So here's the East Coast. You know, you can see the big, monop the big one here from, from DC to Boston is the big black splotch. And look at where the next biggest black splotch is. You know, down here in the southeast, it's from Atlanta to where we're sitting today. And I dare tell you, in 20 years from now, we're going to look like that one. You'll get on I-40 and you'll go east and you won't see farms anymore. You won't see forest. You know, you'll basically see one big, long slug of development. It's coming. The, they call it the Charlanta Piedmont Atlantic Mega Region. Our population is about 32 million. Our annual GDP is 1.4 trillion, right? So we're the equivalent of Korea, of South Korea. You know, we're bigger than Russia, right? So the economy from here to Birmingham, Alabama, along the I-85 and I-40 corridor is bigger than the entire economy of Russia, right? So you gotta have a perspective here. This is a big deal in this region that we're living in. The main uh, leading sectors, finance, biotech, telecom, and manufacturing. How does North Carolina stack up in that region? We're expected to grow by three million more people. Um, you know, Wake County, I think, is something on the lines of um, 15,000 people a year move to Wake County. I think here, I was talking to the assistant county mayor, I think last year was 7,000 people to Pitt County. I mean, we're growing fast, and so we got a plan for that. Jobs in the economy is the most important thing. With these new 3 million people, we need 62,000 new jobs a year. And downtowns are where a lot of those jobs are going to be. A little bit about the rail network. We got $545 million as part of the stimulus plan to double track between Greensboro and parts of Charlotte. It's improved the travel time. Now there's three trains a day between Raleigh and Charlotte. Uh, the Piedmont, has anybody ridden the Piedmont? Yeah, so most people don't know that's, Amtrak operates that train, but it's owned by us. We also run a train back and forth every day to uh, New York City called the Carolinian. That is, anybody ride that? That's, o that's owned by the state of North Carolina and uh, operated by Amtrak and I wasn't sure I was going to use this slide until I dug into the long-range plan of the NCDOT Railroad and they're planning, you see that yellow line from Raleigh to Greenville, they're planning a long-term passenger rail connection to you. That's important. The future I think is going to be rail. Cars will be around, self-driving, whatever it is, you know, all these crazy things. But rail is, people love to ride the train and you can work on it, you can you know, they run a train from Raleigh down to Charlotte for the football game. You can bring beer. You can have a tailgate in the train. If you've never done it, it's really a fun thing to try. <laughs> you know, here we are. I talked about the cycle. We're up there, you know, kind of at the peak. And we're, you know, we'll see if the upswing turns down. Hopefully with the change in politics, maybe it'll continue growing for a few more years. I hope. Um, but I think you need to prepare that a, a recession is likely, probably, hopefully a small one, not like that last one, a small one uh, in the next couple of years. The Knight Foundation, uh, are you a Knight City? Do you have a Knight-owned newspaper here? If you don't, uh, we don't have one in Raleigh, but it's a really important thing. They help to fund innovative thinking about leadership in cities and in downtowns. 
you know, the big thing is always looking for the best ideas that's going to make your city and downtown successful. Never quit looking. Never. There's always a new idea around the corner and they can be game changers. So what works? You know, this is what I found out in my focus group, right? Without a local vision and a consensus around it with priorities, nothing happens, right? So the first step in a downtown is to develop a vision with a series of priorities and strategies that everybody agrees are the things we need to do. Number two, confirm it with your citizens through elections, through public meetings. Let it be a living document and change over time, but stick with the vision. You gotta implement it through strong civic management at the city level, the county level, the university level, through corporate levels. Everybody's got to be behind it or it doesn't work. It's got to be supported by not just the corporate level, but it's got to be supported by the development community, the neighborhoods, and you need a champion. You need somebody who's always out there looking out for downtown and, and trying to make it better. And lastly, I added this one after my lunch meeting today. If you only have one of them, if it's a museum, a performing arts center, a baseball stadium, a library, whatever it is, if you only have one of them, you should put it downtown. When you spread that stuff out over the community, it never has the multiplier effect and the impact that it can generate if they're all together. It took Raleigh a long time to learn that lesson, but we have finally learned it and it's making a big difference. So this is a quote from the, the guy who led the renovation and revitalization of Roanoke, which is done, if you haven't been to Roanoke, it's really phenomenal what they've done. And it's not always the big, there's no silver bullet. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you can read it. There's no silver bullet, it's incremental change over time and keep pushing that ball down the field, that's how you win. You know, going for the Hail Mary every time is not, uh, you know, if you, think, if you think redoing your riverfront park is gonna solve all your problems, it's not. You know, you gotta do a lot of other things to connect it and, and develop around it and make everything work. So here are some trends why I think your position to really succeed. People would kill to have a university, most cities would kill to have the university that you have. The growing, healthy, great university. You're the major metro in Eastern North Carolina. This is, you know, if I'm living 20 minutes from here and I'm not married and I wanna take somebody out on a nice first date, I'm coming here. You know, that's a great, that's a great advantage. You have a strong, local, diverse economy. You know, the lowest unemployment rate in the Eastern counties, that's, that's fantastic. You have high education attainment, something like 30% with bachelor's degree or better. Those are downtown people. Those are the folks that want to live downtown. You're on a river. <laughs> you are on a river. If I could tell you how many public meetings I went to in Raleigh where they said, we just need a river, we need a lake, we need a waterfront. Let's build a canal like San Antonio. And I'm like, do you understand the capital is the high point, right? Water flows downhill. We are not going to have a river in downtown Raleigh. This is not going to happen. You have one. You need to leverage it. Most people would kill for that. And lastly, you've developed, you know, we just heard the momentum that you've developed. It's really hard to turn it around, right? Raleigh was awful, right? I'll, I'll tell you, it, it was terrible in 2000 when I got there. Fayetteville Street Mall was vacant. There were rats this big running all around. I'm not kidding. When they tore up the mall, you should have seen them. They were everywhere. So, you know, you got to make a move to get that momentum turned and clearly, I don't know what all the moves are, but you've done it. And that's a hard thing to do. So who's moving to downtown? It's really three key demographics. Young singles, dinks, dual income, no kids, either they're empty nesters or gay, and older couples. And what are they, what's the key point that gets them here? Usually one of them works here. Right? That's why those 500 new jobs are important because that's your beginning market for non-student housing in downtown. One of them works here and the other one's willing to drive to wherever he or she works. Right? And they make a decision that they want the downtown lifestyle and it's easier for one of them. Usually they can give up a car. You know, and that's about $9,000 a year in expenses if you can get rid of one. What do they want? They want a great experience. They want it to be authentic. They want nightlife. They want to see cafes, they want to see activity on the street, a dense activity on the sidewalks. People really undervalue cafes, it's really important, you know, if you don't see people out there enjoying street life, you think there isn't any, even though the restaurant behind the glass might be full, or the uh, behind the glass of the building is full, they don't know that. They want smaller units, nobody wants a big unit anymore. You know, we're, the ones in Raleigh now are 600, 500 square feet. 
active living. They, because they're in a smaller unit, they're outside. So they want hiking trails. They want fun things to do outside. They want fitness centers is really important. If you don't have a fitness center, you need to get one. Arts and culture, live music, performance, theater, all those things. Good food. Foodies are big now, you know, because they, they're going to be outside eating. You know, they're going to be, they don't, you know, they have a tiny little kitchen in their 500 square foot unit. They want to be outside, you know. And sidewalk density, lots of people. So this was a project that I worked on with Wake County. I want to work for the city of Raleigh. This is a new thousand space parking deck to um, support their new courthouse. And they said, oh, well, we're, we're going to move this parking deck right up to the corner of the street because we want to keep a 35-foot buffer between it and the adjacent properties. And I said, buffer? What, what, what the hell are you talking about? You're in downtown. We don't have buffers. This is not suburban territory. Move that deck back to the 35-foot corner and sell that grass. Sell that 35-foot strip surrounding this deck for housing. Now there's 90 apartments there. The, they debated it for a long time until the tax assessor guy did the calculation and said, Emmett Curl, if you, he could do it in his head almost. He's like, this is going to be a big net win for the city. So you got to think about return on investment. So every public investment in downtown with a parking structure or something else should be evaluated about the investment it returns back to you. And not all things are economic. There are social investments too. I'm not suggesting that everything needs a cash investment. But that's how you make these decisions and establish priorities. Around downtown, this is a gentleman I work with in Raleigh. Around downtown, it's not, people just don't want to, not everybody wants to live in a 500 square foot unit, you know, lying in a parking deck. I don't want to. Uh, people have families, you know, it's not, it's not convenient for everybody. So there's the flippers, right? People who work in the adjacent neighborhoods, revitalizing, turning over housing, re repositioning it. And this is a guy who's done probably 60 or 70 of these in Raleigh, but he used to just use a shotgun, right? He'd shoot a letter out to a whole district, a whole neighborhood, and whoever answered the letter, he'd offer to buy their house and then renovate it and try to sell it. And he's adding value constantly to the people next door who don't renovate their houses, right? It's called the prisoner's dilemma. It's a planning term. You know, you fix yours up, nobody else does. You've added value to them and they've brought yours down, right? So the way to solve that problem is get three or four of these folks, and I'm sure you have them here in Raleigh. I met one, or, or here in Greenville, I met one earlier, and get them to act together in certain neighborhoods, districts, blocks, so that they're adding value to each other and they're place making. Right? It's, it's not just about flipping houses, it's about creating new places and, and, and investing in not just uh, you know, the, the house, but the streetscape, redoing the sidewalk, planting trees, creating little pocket parks, making it add value to itself. And that's what he does. And it's pretty rare to find uh, a guy like that. But if you have one, and I bet you do, here in Greenville, you should encourage him. Everybody laughed at Airbnb in 2000. 2008, zero listings, 2008. 2016, they booked 80 million room nights. Next year, they're going to be bigger than Marriott. Right? I'm on the convention commission in Raleigh, so I deal with the hotels all the time. And believe me, the brand new Marriott we opened, they laughed. They laughed when I brought up Airbnb in the first meeting. Are you worried about them? No. It's a flash in the pan. Nobody wants to share a room in their house. Nobody's going to do that. 80 million room nights. 55% of the people that rent out rooms are women. Single mothers with kids. This is how you keep money in your own economy, right? So you can rent that room out, and you can keep it here, and she can spend it here, or he can spend it here in this economy, or you can give it to Marriott or Hilton and ship it off to wherever the owner of that hotel is. So this is a way to create a more resilient economy. And you think you don't have any? That's a map of downtown Greenville. Those are all the Airbnb units available today. So you can build a hotel bite by bite, right? If you don't have one and you want one, and Tourism is a big part of downtowns. So you can build it in little pieces. And 72% of Americans are willing to look at this. My wife and I do it. Not so much here in the US, but mostly in Europe. We, we did it before Airbnb was a company. I mean, you know, who knows, if we were smart, we would have probably created that website. <laughs> music is huge. People travel for music. The IBMA has been a giant boon to downtown Raleigh. Moot Fest in Durham, the Leaf Fest in Asheville, and the what fest in Greenville? Yeah, so it's big. You know, uh, people travel. They spend the night. It's like going to a football game, right? For people who really love music, they come. They make a day of it. They they tailgate the whole enchilada. And so, you need to think about 
where can you house uh, house that downtown? You know, where is your amphitheater? Where is the place that you can put together four or five venues to host a big festival? Here's how we did it. The expansion block for the convention center is over here on the right. And when we first started planning it, Roger Cooper, who's our convention center director, said, well, that's where I'm going to store the trailers, you know, when the boat show comes to town. That's where we're going to store the, the uh, trailers that the tractors come for the annual tractor show. And I said, this is a four-acre block in the heart of our downtown. We're not going to store trailers there. It's too valuable. So we spent a million dollars building this little stage. And now it gets, seats about 6,000 people. We used the old chairs from the convention center. Right? So the old plastic chairs from the convention center are the chairs that are out there that you sit on. There's some fixed ones too, but mostly the old ones. And it delivers about 200,000 people a year into our downtown when the show's over. And they go where? They go to restaurants, they go to nightclubs, they go to the hotels. It's a big net plus for us. And because we take 15% of the beer sales, the hot dog and the barbecue sales, it almost pays for itself. And guess what? We don't even have to manage it. You know, um, Live Nation manages it for us. And I would suggest, because you're the big metro on the east, you could easily do one of these things. You know, everybody would travel here to see bands. And 5,000, 6,000 seats, sweet spot now, right? Nobody can fill a 20,000, very few people fill a 20,000 seat stadium or an 80,000 seat stadium. This is the sweet spot. I don't know how many times I can say this. You have to take advantage of your river. You have to take advantage of your river. It is crazy. It is crazy to me that when I was down there for 45 minutes today, I didn't see kayakers go by. I didn't see people in tubes. You know, my wife and I, we travel up in the mountains to, with our son to tube down a river. And I'm not kidding you, I, the first time we did it, I bet six, 8,000 people went down that river on a hot, sunny day. I mean, this is a jewel out here. And I, I, like I said, I've been coming here for 10 years. and. The new park that Trillium built is fantastic, but as far as I can tell, that's the only thing that's changed. That's your jewel. Polish it. Uh, the other big strategy now is, uh, you know, everybody can hunt the big uh, IBM, the big pharma company, whatever the big whale is out there in economic development. You need to do that. I'm not saying that's bad. But there's a new strategy called economic gardening. And it's about building resilient economy from within yourself. And part of that is incubating new business. And this is a way now, it's, uh, I'm told by my wife who's a lobbyist that this is going to be legal in North Carolina. It's currently not, where you can be a non-certified investor and invest in a real estate project and expect a return, right? This isn't Kickstarter where you get a hat or a sticker or a button. You put 5,000 bucks or 10,000 bucks in a downtown project, you get a 4% return on your money, you know, if the project succeeds. Currently, it's illegal. Ground Floor founded in Raleigh, this company. Tried to get the law changed, the legislature wouldn't change it, now he's doing it in Atlanta. The most popular one is Fundrise, the earliest one that got all the press up in DC. This is gonna be a big deal in North Carolina. The other one is incubation, right? So this is a project I've been involved with on the east side of Raleigh, it's called the Old Stones Warehouse. And I'm working with Jason Queen, and he's going to put in a million dollar, million and a half dollar kitchen, you know, to, to sell. If your, if your grandma has the best, uh, you know, peanut butter cookie recipe and you want to sell them, you can't make them in your own kitchen. It doesn't meet county health standards. You can't sell them in a, in a, in a store. And so you build this stainless steel, you know, county health board certified kitchen and you rent it out to people who have an idea for a food business. You incubate new chefs, you incubate the cupcake maker, you incubate the next, uh, um, you know, chocolate chip wonder. And eventually they move out and start their own facility and this thing works nonstop. It also helps to support food trucks early on before the people get everything in it. So this is a big deal. The next big one is up, everybody, who's heard of the Rocky Mount Brew Mill? Right? It's the same basic strategy but for brewing beer. So you make a couple batches at home, you think you're great, you want to bottle some up and see if you can sell it. Now there's a place in North Carolina where you can make a, I don't know, 5,000 gallon batch. And this one is one that just blows my mind. This is a new one in Raleigh. And it's, uh, they call it the New South Manufactory, and it's about clothes. So if you think you can make the new blazer that's going to fit me the best, and you have a pattern, they'll help you make the first run of it. They'll help you sew it. And if you get a small order from Belk, they'll help you run the first order until you can find someone to do it. Who here has heard of Raleigh Jeans? Right. 
So that those guys, they didn't start here, but that's the, basically the same model. The, the new one is uh, this one, you know, which is food halls. Anybody been to a food hall yet? Yeah, we're getting ready, I think, to have our first one in Raleigh. I'm not sure 100% about it, but this is a way to get what I call uh, chainlets, right? So you, maybe there's a great barbecue joint, I don't know, 15 miles outside of town. They're successful. They're killing it. Everybody travels there on Sunday to have barbecue, and we want them in downtown Green, Greenville. So you create this food hall that is a sort of smaller places with shared kitchens where they can come in for a small startup fee, move their restaurant downtown, see if it's going to work. And when it works, they can move out and take one of these spaces on, 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 on the street front down here and become, you know, another restaurant in downtown. And it's, so you can chase an Applebee's or, a, you know, Chili's, whatever. But the best thing is to find local people who are already proven successful and get them to come. This is a, a retail strategy we used in a lot, a lot of small towns that I worked in. Active living. You know, people want to be outside. This is the Atlanta Beltline, um, you know, the new sort of uh, bike and eventual, eventual streetcar line around the, um, the city of Atlanta, organizing constant events like this, walking, yoga in the park, all kinds of, of interesting things. Climbing walls on a parking deck. You know, if you have a parking deck downtown, that, that one's in Asheville. Tried for a long time to get one in Raleigh. Bike share, all these things. Uh, this is what the people who are going to live down here want. And it doesn't have to be all about physical fitness. It can be fun. This is Slide Your City. We've had it in Raleigh well, one year. We're having it again. Next year, there's like 10,000 people come to slide down a water slide in the middle of downtown. It's a pretty exciting event. Uh, this was a project I did in Anchorage, Alaska, 70 acres of waterfront land owned by the Alaska Railroad. And I worked with an architect from Kling Stubbins who's, you know, architects, they think differently than planners. And, and he's like, oh, we got to make this place urban. We're going to get all these apartments. We're going to get all this cool stuff, urban, urban. And I said, look, buddy, nobody moves to Alaska for the urban experience. <laughs> you know, they, they have a saying. And when we got up there, it's funny, we got up there. And the saying in Anchorage from people not from Anchorage is, we love Anchorage. It's close to Alaska. <laughs> right? They don't see it as part of the state of Alaska because it, it controls everything, right? It's 400,000 people. The state's population is 750. So they control the state legislature and everything. And so everybody outside hates them. But they're outdoor people. So they didn't have that experience in downtown. So we reconnected all these trails in Brown. You see that river is a king salmon stream, right? So you can leave your office at lunch, catch a salmon, and be back at your desk before the hour's up. But you couldn't get there. Right? They were cut off from it. And the waterfront here, you see this light blue. Has anybody been to Anchorage? It's, uh, it's a lot, you know, so there's about 1,500 feet of pluff mud, like, like you see at the coast here, with a 25 foot tide. It goes from low tide to high tide, it's 25 foot change. And so there's a lot of um, glacial silt. So they're a waterfront city where you can never touch the water. Right? And so that there they have a strong mayor form of government, which means uh, he's the city manager, he appoints every department head, he, he runs the city. He's not just, uh, you know, the guy that gavels in the meetings. And so we, he hired us, and he said, we, we, you know, we made all these connections, we made the salmon stream accessible, we put all this, uh, you know, amphitheater, all this great outdoor stuff, uh, cross-country skiing, uh, climbing, a nice climbing wall. He said, yeah, that's all cool, but it's not big enough. I need you to think bigger. And so we said, well, you know, you're a waterfront city with no waterfront. How about we fill in 100 acres of waterfront and get you to the edge of the water so people can touch it and see it? And we move the cruise ship terminal. Has anybody arrived in Anchorage in a cruise ship? It's awful. They dump you off in a tank farm at the port. I'm not kidding. It's terrible. And so we, we call this the gateway to Alaska. So when you come in on the airport, you come in on a train to a new train station right here because you get off the cruise ship and you get on the Princess train and it takes you to the Princess Resort, you know, it's all connected. And so the cruise ship terminal is here now. You come in from an airplane, you get on a train here and you go up the train and into the interior of Alaska. So we repositioned this as the gateway to Alaska and he loved it so much, he said, I'm gonna use this as a bid for the next Winter Olympics. And then again, you know, the oil, Oil is a blessing and a curse, right? So when it took a dive, they're broke now. Not broke, but they're not doing well. So here's the main square. This is a, you know, this is a bridge 
We have a bridge over the train tracks, and this is in the summertime, it's a, a climbing wall, and in the wintertime, it's an ice climbing wall, and all those trails come right through this main square and down to the, down to the Ship Creek where all the salmon are, and so this becomes a new outdoor heart of this community along the waterfront. And here's what it looks like, uh, you know, looking back towards the mountains. And uh, all of this stuff happens here in this big public square, and that's the train station, and this is the connection up into the existing downtown. Shared streets. If downtown isn't pedestrian friendly, you might as well stop everything else you're working on. If people don't feel comfortable walking here, um, and this is Mexico. <coughs> Bianca saw me give this this slide in another presentation. This is a guy in Mexico that would go and push cars back and help ladies across the street and is trying to prove that he can make single-handedly he's Mexico's, uh, Mexico City superhero for pedestrians. And you have the, she, she liked the idea and created this guy, I don't know, maybe some of you know him, El Walkador. <laughs> so he's apparently made a couple appearances in Greenville. I don't know how many, but it's funny. But the, it sends an important message that uh, without walkability you have nothing else. Here's a shared street. This is Wall Street in Asheville. It's a common one that people know. Here's one in Raleigh. This is City Plaza where the big four towers are. Has anybody been there? So we designed it with no curbs and these little bollards. And the whole idea was that it's not a, it's not a plaza that's bisected by a street. It's a, it's a plaza that happens to have a street north and south of it. And so we kept the same plaza paving. We took the curbs out. We put little ramps so there's a little signal in your car that you're going up. It's like a speed table. And we thought, okay, let's see if it works, you know. And so here's a group of ladies. They're standing in the middle of Fayetteville Street, you know. And so this is a place for pedestrians. Then I hired a bunch of students from NC State with time-lapse cameras to map where people, men and women, crossed to see if we were successful. Because in public space design, you know, what the architect or urban designer thinks and the way people actually use it are two different things. And you always follow back up to make sure that it's doing what you thought it's doing. And if not, change it. Nothing is permanent, you know, cities can be changed. And so this shows where everybody crossed in that plaza, showing that, yeah, it did work, that it is a place for pedestrians, and nobody's afraid to cross the street anymore. You know, we never put the yellow line down the middle of Fayetteville Street. So if you come up there and you take a picture of the cab, you'll see there's no yellow line down the middle. And I got so much crap on the internet, because we didn't have this yellow line. People were saying, how will people know what to do? How will they know what to do? <laughs> And I, finally, I got so mad, I asked this one guy from Cary, you know, who's just flaming me. I said, where do you live in Cary? And he gave me his address, it's in Suburban. I said, well, when you get off Maynard Road, how do you know what to do? How do you know how to get home? He's like, what do you mean? I said, does your street have a yellow line down the middle? He's like, no. And I said, okay. Everybody knows how to drive. You stay to the right. The beauty of it is that you can't get a ticket for jaywalking. Right? And, and if there's no yellow line, you can also park your car facing the wrong direction. Right? So if you're coming down the street and there's a parking space on the left-hand side, you can park over there legally and not get a ticket. But it sends a signal to people. It's a place for people, not cars. This was an idea, same kind of idea. Now I did a master plan, two of them, for downtown Chapel Hill. They don't have a public space. They use UNC's big uh, McCorkle Field for a lot of their public events, and the trees get trampled, and the university finally said, you can't do it anymore. And so every community needs a public space where you can come together. It's a kind of a cliche about a community living room, but you really need that, where everybody comes together in one place. It's one of the few times, 4th of July, lighting up the Christmas tree, those kind of things, where we're all together. And so we try to create a space like that in Chapel Hill. Here's what it looks like. It's again a shared street. This is a place designed for pedestrians that occasionally cars show up in. Okay, so these are my last three slides. What would I do if I was in your shoes? You know, growth is coming. You're not going to stop it. You need to plan for it right now. The three million residents are coming, so make it easy for people to do the things you want them to do. Right? If you want outdoor cafes in downtown, Make it easy to get an outdoor cafe permit. When I started in Raleigh, it took four months. So you'd apply for your permit in April, and you would get it when summer was over. You know, and I said, so we, we got to take it from four months to four minutes, right? So if you come in with the right application and you have all your stuff down, you get the permit that day. For housing, you know, most of these millennials don't have driver's licenses. You know, these parking requirements that we have in downtown are ridiculous. Right? You should get rid of all your parking requirements for housing. 
the bank will tell you how much parking they want to finance for, for your project. Believe me, the, the, the guy in charge of determining the parking requirements in the planning department, he doesn't know, right? I didn't know. You know, so we tried to get rid of the park. We had a, you know, 40% of the people that come into the Raleigh downtown market for hotel rooms come in by plane. They're business travelers. And yet we require one parking space for every hotel room when we know that 40% of the people arrive by taxi. Crazy. You know, so that's the kind of stuff you really got to dig in because a parking space and a structured deck like this new one you have out there, how much? 20,000? You know, 25,000 a space if it's poured in place? These are big investments. Tourism is a major driver. Sports, music, you got sports, you know, you got a great football team. Music, festivals can lead or expand downtown visitation. I'll say it again, leverage that riverfront and create unique experiences. You know, there aren't too many places where you can get in a, in a kayak and go, you know, in four or five hours be at Pamlico Sound or in a Boston whaler and drive all the way up here and park your boat and come into downtown and do something. You know, that is a unique experience that not many other cities can create. Please create it. <laughs> the sharing economy is a significant for small business, new small business. So make it easy. You know, don't regulate Uber. You know, you're not the Outer Banks. You're not San Francisco. You're not New York City. This is what I keep telling our counselors in Raleigh. Why are you making it hard? You know, we're not a tourism economy. These are not displacing, you know, affordable housing for families. You know, if you're in those cities, okay. You, you got to think about it. But if you're in Greenville or Raleigh or Durham, it's not an issue. Don't be afraid of it. And then, you know, make the other stuff easy. You know, the, the shared kitchen is a piece of creative infrastructure. A shared co-working space is a piece of creative infrastructure. These millenniums, they don't think about infrastructure like pipes and sewer and water. They think about other things. Address their needs and you'll do better. And you'll create jobs that are, in the economic development world we call sticky. Right? So, so you, you, you pay some guy an incentive or some company an incentive to move to Greenville. Four years later, Wilmington's going to pay double that amount. Where's that guy going? He's going to Wilmington. He's not sticky. But if you help a small businessman, a young millennial person or hipster, whatever it is, or somebody with just a great idea, and you help them create that business through a shared kitchen or a shared workspace or, or through their you know, Uber license or whatever it is, they're likely to stay here because you helped them. And they're from here, and that's what we call sticky. Oh, I guess I'm going to say it again. Create new parks and facilities that draw residents and tourists. Complete your waterfront park and build an amphitheater there. One that, one that Live Nation can program, right? So don't just build a, a, a stage like the one you have now. If it's not the right size for the the backdrop television screen and the new lighting and all that stuff, they'll go to the next city. So make sure you build that piece of, of infrastructure, talking to promoters and people who book bands on a regular basis, because if you build it wrong, they're going right by you. I think the federal government and the state government are going to spend some money on infrastructure. It's just a matter of time. I think it's inevitable, so get shovel ready and figure out what projects you have, build community support for it, and get ready to ask for the money. It's coming. Rail is the mobility connection of the future, I think. Roads will always take care of themselves. They're always going to get built. R rail is the next one. I'm not talking about light rail transit. I'm talking about this big connection across the state of North Carolina. Whoever it is, I don't know who drew that yellow line on the NCDOT map, but you need to find that person and make sure that they're securing the right-of-way now while they can and, and start planning for it. And if, and if you don't know who it is, start lobbying the legislature to get someone to start doing it. Lastly, new housing types are evolving constantly. Overregulation stifles that. Try, don't be afraid to try pilot projects, to give someone a chance to do something different, to test the market and whether the public's going to accept it. If they're willing to risk their money and their investment on it, you ought to be willing to risk the approval of it. It's not that difficult. I argued for years in Raleigh that we ought to allow 16 unit buildings with no parking as a right, as a right. Now there's eight of them under construction across the street from NC State, right? Because the kids today don't have cars. They want to walk, and you don't have to build the big parking deck. And now, finally, people are looking on the periphery of downtown where to build those 16-unit no parking projects for young, not students, but young people working in downtown that don't have a car, want to live within walking distance of downtown in a small unit that they can manage. 
you have a unique position similar to Raleigh and that the government owns a lot of the government owns a lot of land downtown a lot of land <laughs> they need to work together with a common disposition strategy and a vision for what that land can become forever I, I wrote a paper in 2007 about this exact same strategy in Raleigh saying you know we can get the county the state and the city there were 72 acres of land that they own in downtown Raleigh that they were they were all contemplating a little bit contemplating selling it and it's always to the highest bidder right because they're protecting taxpayer dollars we got to sell it to the person who's going to offer us the most without a common strategy for how to do it all together. And people said, oh, there's no way, there's no way that you can get the city, the county, and the state to cooperate on the disposition of property, and they're never gonna all sell it. Guess what happened when Government Quarry got elected? The city, the county, and the state were all considering selling big chunks of land in downtown Raleigh with no coordination. You need to get out in front of that ball now and take an estimate of where the county owns land, this big chunks of land they own next to that park, Oh my goodness, you know, I mean, redeveloping that, would, the return on investment for that would be huge because you go from zero tax revenue to, um, you know, big tax revenue. It's not a hard thing to do. And then lastly, build affordable housing now. This is a lesson we learned in Raleigh. It's never going to be cheaper to build affordable housing than it is today. The price of land in Greenville, because you're growing fast, you have these great assets of the river, the university, the hospital, you have a unique position in eastern North Carolina, it's only going to get more expensive. Build it today if you can. Decouple the parking space from the unit. So, so you only can, you can choose, right? So if you, if you don't want to rent a, a parking space, you don't, your rent goes down by the $120 a month it takes to finance that space. Right, so, so we have a few projects, we made it legal, we had a few projects in Raleigh where you don't have to rent a space if you, don't, if you rent an apartment. That wrap, that wrap of the county parking deck, the, they only pay for the space if they use it. They don't have to get it with their apartment. And there's no numbers. Quit numbering parking spaces, right? It's, it's called a hunting license, you know? You park where it's open. Because most of the time that numbered space is empty. And that's a $25,000 investment that you're not going to get back. And like infrastructure, I would argue parking deck is no different than a sewer line. You want to use that thing 24 hours a day. You don't want it to be empty from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. So you can double sell it. You know, so the, the, the hotel and office users are exact opposite each other, right? All the office people go home at 5. That's when the hotel people come, you know, away from wherever they're working or whatever they're doing. They come back to the room. So you can sell that space twice. And, and that's what you need to do because we're all subsidizing parking. There is no such thing as free parking. None. And the fact that you give it away on your main street right now is crazy. You need to charge for parking. Did you hear me? You need to charge for parking because I can guarantee you I can come down here tomorrow and count who's parking in those spaces and if I had the the state's uh, you know, license reader and match it up to the employees in downtown, that's who's parking in all those spaces. I bet 80% of them are from people who work in the shops right in front of them. And you need to create turnover. It needs to be in someone's mind that when they leave their house 20 miles from here, they might be able to find a space out in front of where they're going in downtown. They don't always have to find it, they have to think in their head, I might be able to do it. And the way you do that is by raising the price of on-street parking until at any given time, there's two empty spaces per block. People don't mind paying for parking. And if you think you're gonna compete with the mall on the basis of the parking cost, you are gonna lose. You are selling an experience downtown that is different than the mall, that is different than the strip shopping center out on um, you know, Bypass Street, whatever it is called here. You know, you're selling an experience and, and people are willing to pay for that. When they first started charging for, charging for parking in downtown Raleigh, nobody knew it was a problem until the, until the restaurateurs and retailers told everybody it was. So people didn't have a problem paying $1.50 to park for two hours until they went in the restaurant and the restaurateur said, isn't it awful you had to pay for parking? And I was like, well, um, no. You know, I'm used to paying for parking in a city. That's how it works. And so I would argue there's a great book called The High Cost of Free Parking by Donald Shoup. It's 700 pages. I've read it twice. 
you need to read that book because the way we manage it now in downtowns is wrong. You need to charge for it. It's the only way that you can get people out of their house because they're constantly circling, looking for a parking space, and it's filled by people who work here, not people who are coming to spend money. So it's self-defeating to give it away for free. It's the most valuable land you have as a city. I'll take a few questions if anybody has one. <laughs> Sorry, I went over. <laughs> 